Today, you relax, everything is just fine, says APRA. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australia flavour. APRA remains in a low risk bubble, according to their paper released today, which keeps the banking counter cyclical buffer at zero. However, they flag that it may change ahead. Now, I have to say this seems perverse given the high debt levels and low economic performance and increased risks. It's plain weird, and a million miles off the Reserve Bank of New Zealand's approach, which is to up capital significantly. But let's see why they're taking this stance. APRA's current assessment of the systemic risk environment is based, they say, on a set of core indicators that form part of APRA's framework for the counter-cyclical capital buffer. This set of core indicators was expanded in late 2018. That said, there's no mechanical link between any specific indicator and the level at which APRA sets the buffers. Buffer decisions, they say, are primarily based on judgment, taking into account all the available information. And this flexible approach is in line that is used by most other countries, they say. So let's look at the areas that drive their decisions. The first area is credit growth, including the credit to GDP gap, housing credit growth, investor housing credit growth, business credit growth, commercial property exposure growth, and the annual change in household debt to income. The credit to GDP gap is the difference between the credit to GDP ratio and its long term trend. A credit to GDP ratio significantly above its long term run trend, a positive gap, could indicate excessive credit growth. The credit to GDP gap in Australia has been negative since late 2016. The gap has decreased further, become more negative over recent years, as credit has generally grown more slowly than nominal GDP. The credit to GDP gap is the only indicator mandated in the Baal Committee guidance on how countries should operate the counter-cyclical capital buffer. While it has been found to be a useful early warning indicator of banking crises in some studies, it is acknowledged to not be useful for all countries and at all points in time. In Australia, credit has grown at a rapid pace over recent decades. This rapid credit growth has given the credit to GDP ratio a strong upward trend that does not accord with APRA's assessment of prudent levels of credit growth. Largely for this reason, APRA does not place a heavy weight on the credit to GDP gap when assessing systemic risk or setting the counter-cyclical capital buffers. This accords with the practice in most countries that have adopted the counter-cyclical capital buffer. Housing credit, the largest component of borrowing by the non-financial sector in Australia, has grown at a historically low rate in the past year. Annual growth in housing credit over the 12 months to October was 3%, which is the lowest growth rate since the beginning of this data series in the 1970s. This reflects a number of factors, including low growth in nominal household income and subdued housing market conditions over most of the past year. All of the growth over the past 12 months was in lending to owner-occupiers, as lending to investors did not grow over this period. Owner-occupied credit growth has strengthened somewhat in recent months, and loan approvals data suggest that this trend is likely to continue in the near future. Monthly owner-occupied commitments for new loans increased by 17% between May and September. Investor loan commitments have also increased, but to a smaller extent, suggesting demand for credit from investors has remained limited to date. Whilst historically slow, growth in household debt has been faster than growth in household income in Australia in recent times. The net result of this was an increase in the household debt to income ratio of three percentage points over the year to June 2019. The household debt to income ratio is high in Australia compared to an average of other advanced countries and is therefore notable in the assessment of systemic risk levels. 
Business credit growth has been somewhat weak over the past year. Over the past six months to October, it grew by around 2% in annualised terms. Lending for commercial property, a component of business credit, has also been growing slowly recently. Data from the ABS and listed companies' financial accounts indicate that leverage in the broader business sector remains at moderate levels. Second is asset prices, commercial property price growth and house price growth. They say that at a national level, housing prices fell during 2018 and the first part of 2019. This national fall was driven by falls in Sydney, Melbourne and Perth. Prices in Sydney and Melbourne declined by 15 and 11% respectively from peak to trough. Prices began rising in Sydney and Melbourne in mid-2019 and are now rising at a fast pace. Over the three months to November, prices in Sydney and Melbourne rose at annualised rates of 23% and 26% respectively. The increase in price momentum has broadened over recent months and prices have begun rising in some other capital cities too, including Brisbane and Adelaide, and the pace of price declines has moderated in others. Despite positive price momentum in capital cities, prices continue to decline in other parts of the country. Over the three months to November, prices declined in areas where around 20% of the Australian population lives. These areas include parts of Perth, Darwin and Brisbane, as well as regional areas in Western Australia, Queensland and New South Wales. The broad-based falls in house prices over 2018 and the first half of 2019 mean that there are a number of areas where prices remain significantly below their peak level. This is most evident in Western Australia, regional Queensland and the Northern Territory. A number of factors likely underlie the change in price momentum seen over recent months. These include the recent declines in variable mortgage rates following reductions in the RBA's cash rate, the removal of policy uncertainty following the federal election, and APRA's loosening of serviceability requirements. Housing turnover also remains at a subdued level. At present, price increases have not been driven by large increases in household credit or borrowing, or a loosening of lending standards. Valuations of office and industrial properties continued to increase rapidly over the past year. In contrast, prices of retail commercial properties fell by around 5%. And while commercial property exposures make up only a small share of a bank's total credit exposures, they have the potential to experience high loss rates during downturns. Commercial property lending accounted for a large proportion of banks' losses during the downturn of the early 1990s and in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, and they also typically account for a significant share of losses in APRA's bank stress tests. Third, lending indicators, higher risk residential mortgage lending, business lending conditions, and loan pricing and margins. Across banks, the aggregate risk profile of new housing lending has been fairly stable over the past year. The share of new lending undertaken as a loan-to-value ratio, an LVR ratio, above 90% remains steady at around 7%, and the share that is interest-only declined slightly to be around 14%. Consistent with the discussion of credit growth above, the share of new lending that was investor lending was 30% over the past year. All of these shares are significantly lower than levels prevailing in 2014. These changes have been driven in part by a significant program of work by APRA, which included both guidance on lending standards and temporary quantitative benchmarks on higher risk types of lending. APRA has invested in collecting additional data on residential mortgage over recent years. In particular, APRA now collects new lending by loan to income, LTI, and debt to income, DTI ratios. These measures provide a view on the vulnerability of lenders and borrowers to income shocks. For example, a borrower with a high debt to income ratio may be more likely to default on mortgage repayments during a period of unemployment. The shares of new mortgage lending undertaken at high debt to income levels has been fairly stable over the period in which this data has been collected. And these aggregate levels mask some variations in lending standards across the banks. Some large ADIs extend a significantly greater share of their mortgage lending at high debt-to-income ratios. Banks can alter the composition of their new housing lending by offering different pricing on different product types. Differential pricing emerged during the period when APRA's quantitative benchmarks on investor and interest-only lending were enforced and involved significant spreads between these mortgage types 
and owner-occupied principal and interest loans, the extra spread charged for one type of loan, investor interest only, has declined modestly over recent months. Further declines in this spread and therefore declines in interest rates on interest-only lending and investor lending may lead to increases in investor and interest-only lending. Changes in business lending standards have been mixed over the past year. Data from APRA's Credit Conditions and Lending Standards Survey indicates some loosening in lending conditions for residential development, following a period of considerable tightening in this area. For general large business lending, the survey indicates ongoing compression in margins and increases in loan terms. And banks report some caution in lending for retail commercial property. Small business lending has grown more slowly than lending to large businesses over the past year, and this may reflect some tightening in lending standards for these loans. And fourth, financial stress, including non-performing loans and returns on bank equity. The aggregate non-performing loan ratio for banks in Australia is low. Consistent with this, major banks' bad debt charges were at very low levels in their recent profit results. When reviewing by borrowing type, the non-performing loan ratio for business lending has risen slightly over the past quarter, but it remains close to its post-GFC low. The share of loans to households that are non-performing has been increasing gradually over the past five years. The housing loans arrears rate is now around 1%, having risen from 0.6% in 2014. Around one half of the rise in the national housing arrears rate since 2014 is due to rising arrears in Western Australia. The arrears rate in this state has risen steadily since 2014 due to rising unemployment and the fall in housing prices discussed above. Arrears rates have also risen steadily in Queensland and South Australia over this period. Over recent years, arrears rates have also been rising in New South Wales and Victoria, but from a low base. And APRA continues to closely monitor state-level housing arrears Profits provide a buffer that protects the banking system from negative shocks. The profitability of the banking system declined slightly over the past year, but remains relatively high by comparison to banking systems in many other advanced countries. This lower profitability over the past year has been driven by slow credit growth, lower interest rates, and costs and provisions associated with the operational failures and misconduct. The low interest rate environment is likely to lower banking system profitability over the coming years as effective limits on minimum deposit rates lead to lower net interest income. A separate but important risk to banks is a search for yield dynamic caused by low rates. This is a dynamic under which banks increase the riskiness of their lending in order to target rates of higher return in order to target rates of return achieved in higher interest rate environments. This is more likely to occur at banks that do not adjust their return on equity targets. Current levels of banking system resilience and the broader operating environment are also important when assessing the overall level of systemic risk and setting the counter-cyclical capital buffers. In aggregate, and for almost all banks, capital ratios are now at or above the benchmark levels at Preset in response to the recommendations of the 2014 Financial System Inquiry. Large banks have also begun to increase their Tier 2 capital in order to satisfy the total loss-absorbing capital requirements set out by APRA early in 2019. Taken together, this suggests that the Australian banking system has sufficient capacity to absorb large economic and financial shocks. And over recent years, large banks in Australia have experienced significant costs and expenses due to misconduct and poor management of operational risk. The Royal Commission into Misconduct in the Banking Superannuation and Financial Services Industry, which was finalised in early 2019, was a major catalyst in the recognition of these issues. It brought to light a range of misconduct and other issues, and banks were forced to begin large customer remediation programs. In a number of cases, financial regulators have also imposed large fines on banks and forced them to undertake significant remediation. While it is entirely appropriate for financial costs and penalties to be imposed in these cases, this heightened operational risk environment needs to be considered as part of the broad systemic risk environment. APRA has taken action to partly offset this contribution to systemic risk by forcing large banks to hold additional capital against operational risk. The broader economic environment is also a relevant consideration. Over the past year, the growth rate of the Australian economy has slowed substantially. A significant part of this slowing has been due to weaker-than-expected household consumption. The national unemployment rate has also risen, but only to a small degree.
A number of forecasters are predicting a gradual increase in the growth of economic activity over 2020, underpinned by recent stimulus and a recovery in the housing market. Recent reductions in the cash rates are expected to support this outcome. Many of the risks to this economic outlook and the potential triggers for systemic risk events are global. Trade and technology tensions between the United States and China have continued over the past year, creating an uncertain global business environment. Political tensions continue in Hong Kong and appear to have led to a sharp contraction in the economy of this financial hub. Brexit remains unresolved. Taken together, current levels of banking system resilience and the broader operating environment support APRA's decision to maintain the countercyclical capital buffer at zero. So there you have it, their rationale. Now, three quick points. The first is APRA is right to look at debt to income and loan to income ratios, but remember that they're looking at data at a loan level, not a household level. And that's something that they have admitted several times recently. So if you have a mortgage that's split between multiple parts, in fact, the debt to income ratio and the debt servicing ratio will be higher than APRA is aware of. The second point I want to make is while they do take account of household finances, I think they're underestimating the pressures on households. We certainly see them our financial stress and confidence metrics. And as incomes continue to grow very slowly and the cost of livings rise and unemployment rise, these pressures, I think, are much more significant than APRA is giving credit for. The third is that whilst there has been some uplift in home prices, it's interesting that they quote the core logic data, which of course is relatively bullish. And by the way, that core logic data also feeds the ABS data, as we discussed yesterday. But there are other metrics out there from REA and also from Domain that suggest that actually home prices in real terms have not risen anything like as much as they're claiming. So I think they should be cautious and we should be cautious about how much property prices are rising. And in the light of that, they may well be understating the proportion of households in negative equity currently. We see that in our surveys, particularly in Western Australia and around some of the suburban areas in our major centres, particularly in and around Sydney and Melbourne. The fact is that there are pockets where prices are much higher but there are also pockets where prices are significantly down. And therefore, the risk in the system could well be higher. And standing back, if you look at New Zealand, where they are definitely stepping up capital, the capital rules here in Australia are much more generous with regard to the banks. And did you also notice that APRA has given the banks some wriggle room simply because they've had to pay large penalties out as a result of their bad behaviour? I find that pretty remarkable, frankly. So... The bottom line for me is that I think APRA has hooked this. They have been too willing to look for the positive in all the data and not willing enough to take account of falling GDP and the rise in unemployment and the pressure on households and the continued concern about lending standards in the banks. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Be interested to see what you think. Do you think APRA have got it right or do you think they're being too generous to the banks? I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.